fathers and sons have always had issues, you know, and uh, uh, and yet there's love there too, and uh, maybe it's because there's so much love that there are issues. They may all go together. Um, okay, so the homework assignment last week was that you would all would write your own psalm, right? A psalm from your life. It could be general, it could be specific, it could be about an incident, it could be uh, morose and depressing, it, it could be joyful and triumphant. I didn't specify, and then you, you email them to me. Now you have to keep doing this, okay? Because all summer long, each week, we're gonna read one or two of these, and we're going to start to hear the Psalms of our congregation, basically. Okay, the, the voice of our congregation. So I want to read a couple of them for you that came in this week. Um, I think I'm not going to give the names, okay? Is that all right as we do this? So you can just, you can guess if it was you. <laughs> okay, here's, here's one. Hear my heart, O Lord, and know that I am real. In my love, in my disdain, in my gratitude, but my indifference, in my joy and my sadness, in my patience, in my frustration. Know my heart, O oh Lord. You are the center of my universe. Lead me in your way now and forever. I wrote that with them. Uh, <laughs> okay, here, here's another one. And, and, some similar themes have come out in this one. This is called uh, a psalm of thankfulness. When I seem lost, you're there to guide me. When life has its ups and downs, you are there to hold me. In the winning and the losing, you're there teaching. When life seems darkest, you're there with hope. Simply speaking, your name can set my body on fire. What a blessing to have you by my side. When life takes turns that we do not see coming, you're there to provide insight into why. Truly, you provide me with life abundant through trials, tribulations, and joy. Thank you, truly. Your love never fails. Is that good? Okay, so send me your psalms, okay? John Westfall at jwestfall.com, okay? And we're going to keep these going, and we're going to, I think that we're going to be stunned at the life and the faith and the hope and the fear and all of those things that we learn from each other as we, as we do this, okay? So no excuses. Um, our psalm today is, uh, that we're going to be looking at as we go through this uh, series of psalms all summer long, um, it's one that, uh, that has meaning for me, and I'll, I'll share it with you, um, uh, and you know the story probably, uh, years ago when our son Damien was uh, about 12, um, he decided he wanted to be baptized, and so... Uh, the church we were at, there was a, a tradition that whoever was getting baptized, or their parents if they were an uh, infant, would, would uh, choose a Bible verse to be read at the baptism. And, um, and Damien said, I'm picking my verse and everything, and I was inquisitive, and so he told me what the verse was, and I said, that is stupid, that is just wrong. We are not, you are not getting up and doing that one, I'll tell you that, you know, right now. And, uh, and he kept going, Dad? It's my baptism, it's my verse. So back off. You know, at 12 he said that. You know, that's just wrong. And, uh, and so uh, the day of his baptism came and uh, when he was baptized he, he read this from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. And I didn't know at the time that that was actually going to be his life verse. And um, 
And so that psalm has always been um, very intense to me. And, and you know, and I've, I've preached that and thought about it and talked about it. And the thing I realized is um, I never uh, actually preached the rest of the psalm. I kind of get stuck right on that, you know, because it's personal. Um, and I thought, so what happens to us in our lives in the in-between times? You know, when we look at that first part of Psalm 40, you know, it's all you're waiting, you're in the muck and the mire, and you're calling out to the Lord, and, and you're just trusting that God's going to come through, and then he does, and he, and he makes you solid and uh, gives you a new song to sing. I, that is so good and so complete, but it, it's kind of like a TV show, you know, a half hour where they get in all kinds of problems, and then it works out by the end. And, and I just found my life never worked out at the end of the half hour. And sometimes I've, I've heard you, yours it doesn't either, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and the story goes on. And so uh, the thought is what happens to us in the in-between times? Um, how do we trust God in the times where we really need the Lord to be present, but we're not necessarily seeing uh, his hand at work, or we don't uh, see the answers that we're longing for or praying for. How do we live in that? Anybody, have you ever, am I alone in this? Do you guys ever find yourself in the in-between? Um, it's just a, so anyway, so I, I wanted to look at this psalm a little differently and not harangue about being stuck in the muck and mire, because you all know about that. Um, but I want us to look at this in-between time, and the big question becomes, uh, happy is the one who makes the Lord his trust who doesn't look to the proud to those who turn aside to false gods and this issue of trusting God that happiness, blessedness comes uh, when we put our trust in the Lord instead of falling into the temptation of turning to quick answers or answers that seem like well maybe that would work you know and, um, and get off track further because I don't know about you but for me when I'm in the muck and the mire I feel like I've got an excuse to get off track you know look what I'm going through well who would blame me if I you know walked over here and and yet that's the time when we most need to be trusting God and that actually our joy and our happiness will, will arise out of our putting our trust where it belongs. Now, I, uh, I look at this psalm and, uh, and I think, um, what is it that in the in-between time makes it difficult for us to uh, be triumphant? You know, like, uh, did anybody ever go to Sunday school as a kid? Yeah. Did you do that? We had a song in Sunday school. Let's see if I get this right. V is for victory. Sing it out. Tis a glorious day. V is for victory. You don't remember that song? Okay, no. Say it. Uh, we did. Wait, one person over here. Okay, well, see, there you go. Thank you. I'll just talk to you, Susie. You know. we, and we would march around the Sunday school class. B is for victory. You know. and, and like a marching band. It's kind of like a Fourth of July parade, you know. And, and, and I, I really got the message there that, you know, if you're following Jesus, if, if, if God's in your heart and you're, you're full of faith, your life is going to be victorious, right? We'd be marching around, singing, and everybody goes, whoa, what a great life they got. I didn't find that to be the case down the road. And I realized, oh, they lied to me in Sunday school. <laughs> they lied. It was all a lie. Uh, because actually, it's the living in the in-between times when we, when we must trust in God. And, and, and we look at what our alternatives are. Now, he says, when you do this, don't, um, don't listen to, don't put your faith in, um, in the proud people and, and in those uh, who have turned aside to false gods. And then immediately he jumps into um, 
sacrifice and offering, Lord, you didn't desire. Burnt offering, sin offering, you didn't require. And then I said, here I am. Now, I'm, I look at that, I go, what is that saying to us? Well, one is that when we find ourselves in this in-between time, sometimes there's a desperate compulsion to try and get it fixed and get out of it. I don't know about you, but I don't like the waiting, the in-between, the silence, the uh, wondering. And so there's lots of people and lots of situations where people say, look, if you just do this, this will all work out, blah, 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 da, da. And you can be V is for victory all over again, you know? And I kind of want that. I, don't you, don't you kind of want that? Woohoo! You know? Why does it when I say woohoo, it sounds kind of pathetic? <laughs> 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 Come on, John, say it like you mean it. You know, and that, but the other thing is the false god turning away to false gods. What is it that it immediately talks about? Religion. What's the biggest, most destructive, false god that we can possibly have? Religion. It has destroyed lives. It has destroyed our world in so many ways. It's destroyed us. And, and this is telling us from the very beginning, God never attend, uh, intended for us to become religious people to get by. That's, that's a dead end street. Now as a pastor, you know, I went kind of 90 miles an hour down the dead end street, you know. But, um, but I learned and, and I discovered that actually God doesn't want that from us. What does he want? He wants us to show up and say, here I am. Here I am. Just like it says right here. I don't want your offering. I don't want the sacrifice. I don't want any of that. And then I said, here I am. I've come. That's the difference between having a relationship with Christ and saying, Lord, yes, I need you in my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to... to Make your priorities my priorities, and your agenda my agenda. And, and this, I'm not very loving. I need you to love people through me because I'm kind of a mean person, you know, or I'm struggling with this here. I need you to help me with this. I need wisdom. I need you to take over my life and make me like you. That is so not religious. Trust me. As a missionary kid and growing up in Sunday school and leading the singing for V's for victory, you know, God saved me from any religious instincts. And it was a miracle. Uh, no telling what would have happened if I would have been religious. But then it doesn't end there. He says, I have not hid your righteousness. I didn't hide it in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I don't conceal your love and your truth. Are you getting this? Sometimes when we're in those in-between times, we feel like, you know, we bought it, probably ought to just shut up. You know? How can we talk about the Lord's love and care when we're not exactly experiencing it right now? And how can we talk about God's righteousness when we're kind of uh, going sideways? And how can we talk about the truth when we're kind of living a lie? How does that happen? And so we get quiet and we go inward, right? We turn inward when we should be looking outward. We do the exact most harmful thing we can do. <clears throat> Turn in on ourselves and get quiet, right? And, I, and I've talked with people and, and I, I understand the, you know, the feeling behind it, but it's the, it's the thing of, well, as soon as God acts, as soon as everything's worked out, as soon as my life is together, as soon as, you know, everything is happening right for me, then I'm going to tell people about how great God is. But not until then. And we've grown up generations of mute Christians. You know, like you're watching on TV and you, and you, don't, you don't like what the announcers are saying at the uh, US Open, and so you just click the mute thing and you can watch them play and, and not have to listen to all that garbage, you know? Uh, 
somebody clicked the mute button on the church. And we go, something, what happened? We lost our voice. And, and I love that the psalmist, in the pit, in the slimy bog, says, I proclaim righteousness. I do not seal my lips, as you know, Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I'm just going to keep this to myself. You know, my relationship with God is personal. You know, it's not really something that should be shared. I'm going to keep that to myself. You know? Why? He said, I haven't hidden your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your salvation. I don't conceal your love or your truth. And then he makes a deal. So don't withhold your mercy from me. I'm talking about it. I'm expecting it. I'm believing it. I'm trusting. So don't withhold your mercy from me. I think that when we feel like something's being withheld, it's more painful, isn't it? Um, why would God, if God is merciful and compassionate, uh, why would he withhold that? That's kind of the opposite of mercy, isn't it? Isn't it the opposite of mercy to withhold? Of course God doesn't withhold his mercy from us. We need to see it. Remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about God said, I have inscribed you in the palm of my hand. So I'll never forget you. Your life right there in front of me. And last week, the, the verse was, um, your life is written in my book. Right? Well, why would God forget us then? Why would he withhold his mercy? Why would he not want us to experience his mercy? Why, why wouldn't he want us to experience his, his uh, tender compassion? He does. Then, this psalm, I love this because when you're in between, it's like all of life right there, right? It's not just a little picture, it's all of life. And so this psalm, you're going along, he's talking about how he's got this faith in the, in the midst of the problems, and he's proclaiming it, and he's not keeping it a secret, and he is letting people know, and he's sharing his faith all around him, and he's saying, God, don't withhold your mercy. I'm going to need your protection. I'm going to need your love. Why? This is, and now we get to the real thing. Evil is personal. <laughs> Evil is personal. And until we understand that, we never understand what's going on in our world. And in our world. It's not a vague principle. It's not a force in the universe. Uh, kind of like a Star Wars-y sort of thing, you know. That's not it. It's personal. And so what, is the, what does the psalmist say? Come quickly and help me. May all who seek to take away my life be put to shame and confusion. Now, I thought that used to mean, you know, somebody wants to kill you. Actually, someone may want your job. They may want your situation. They may want your money. They may want your whatever. They want to take your life. That's more common than we talk about, actually. Uh, I, I meet with a guy who's writing a book on office politics. And uh, every Wednesday we meet up here at Holy Grounds Coffee. And, uh, and he's talking about this and how in the corporate world people want to take your life. And that's the essence of office politics. That they actually want what you have. They want who you are. They want your situation. And, the, and they'll work to undermine you to get that. And he's saying, you know, people are, are working to take my life. Put them to shame and confusion. And everyone who desires my ruin, make them be turned back in disgrace. And then I love this verse. I'm going to put this on my uh, tombstone. May those who say to me, aha, aha. <laughs> That's what it says. 
be appalled in their own shame. Aha! Caught you. You know, it's their own shame. It's not ours. I love this because he's saying, I understand the essence of how evil works out in the in-between times in our life. And it's very, very personal, and it could be a little bit mundane, and it's all around us, right? And then it ends in a really interesting way. It all goes back to, yep, I'm, I'm poor, I'm needy, I need you. I need you. The Lord, think of me. Think of me. I think that we need to grasp that in our in-between times because if we feel forgotten or so insignificant that, that we don't cross God's mind, then that in-between time is hell literally forgotten by God so he's saying Lord think of me because in that is our hope in in that the realization that I'm trusting in God and God is thinking of me he knows my situation he knows my weakness he knows my propensity to wander off he knows uh, the enemies in my life he knows the reality of it and he's thinking of me See, we can only write our psalms when we recognize that God's thinking of us. Otherwise, we're just writing poetry, right? But, now, having looked at that psalm, I want you to go back to the first couple of verses. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. And then, what did he do? He put a new song in my heart a new song in my mouth, and a hymn of praise to God, and many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. What's this saying? A new song of praise. That's our worship. Individually, collectively. And what it's saying is, when, when we experience God's presence and power and redemption and protection, and we, we, we recognize that God is putting us, making us stable, We can sing out that praise and people will observe our worship and turn to the Lord. Just watching our worship when it's authentic. When it's not V's for victory, let's, let's try and make ourselves happy. Uh, but when it's authentic and it comes from a realization that God is thinking of us in these in-between times when we need to be remembered, right? That's when. And so, um, today, I want you to think about what does your in-between time look like for you? For each of us, it's gonna be different, right? It's gonna be different. And so, take, take a hold. And you, you haven't all written your Psalms, I know this, okay? I know this because I know exactly how many have been sent to me. <laughs> I'm keeping a tab on that. <laughs> and it will not get us through the summer, okay? <laughs> I just want you to know that. <laughs> I want you to do that psalm, and I want you to do a psalm for your in-between time. Where do you need the Lord to, to, to speak to you? And where do you need the Lord to touch your life? And where do you need, where you need God to show up And ask him for that. Where do you need Christ to make a difference in your life this week? Where do you need his help? Ask him for that. And then thank him for thinking of you and remembering you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have so much in life and we don't understand a lot and we don't always get it right, but Lord, we, we thank you that you don't leave us and you don't forget us and you don't abandon us.
Give us the courage to trust you and not turn aside, but to trust you even when we're in between. Maybe especially when we're in between. And we thank you for remembering us. Amen.